since uh, 95 on a full time basis my own journey which I have shared part of my journey with you but my own journey has consisted of trying to understand the true history of our culture, the true philosophy and metaphysics of our culture, the true yoga and the true sadhana, the true tantra, the different schools of our, uh, of our culture. Why these are not properly understood today, where the distortion came from, what to do about it. Because without a proper diagnosis, you cannot have a treatment. If your diagnosis is incorrect, then your treatment is also not going to work. So while a lot of energy goes from so many of our people trying to do something, I have focused on a better analysis and understanding, in other words, a better diagnosis of where these problems come from in the first place, why they are there. And in this I started using a methodology which I practiced in my career once I used to be a management consultant, looking at industry analysis and coming up with strategic plans for large clients, AT&T, these kind of people. So when you look at an industry, you look at who are all the players, what is the delivery chain, who are the suppliers, who are the young users, and so on. So I started looking at the study of dharma and the study of India as an industry. Who studies India? Who are the professors? Who are the think tanks? Who are the seminaries? Who are the government policy makers? Who studies India and dharma? Why they study? What they study? Why they reach certain conclusions? What is the consequence of these conclusions? Who funds them? So I wanted to build a whole portfolio of the study of India and its civilization as it happens in the West because that is then exported to India also. So we started building a large database of uh, you know who's who and what is what in the study of India. Because what you see often on the surface may look like one thing but when you know the deeper uh, relationships of those people, their policies, who they are working for, what is their ideology, what is their politics, then you understand it differently. So I feel that there is a, there, I, I found that there is a lot of misunderstanding on the part of our leaders concerning our own dharma, concerning who is studying it properly, who is not studying it properly. I found our guru is not very interested in this kind of analysis. Uh, and I found a lot of our political leaders, our community leaders, not really well informed about the big picture in a, in a deep way about the state of our government. So I started my own quest with the, my foundation and getting people to help and all that. And I found a very troubling scenario. I found that there are not only just some random individuals who are depleting the legitimacy of dharma, but institutions, organizations, deep ideologies, undermining not only mandir, but gurus, symbols, sacred texts, deities, paramparas, sampradayas, each of them taken systematically one by one, taken apart and distorted and presented in a way that would make young Hindus ashamed and leave their tradition or start diluting their identity with crazy ideas like everything is the same and so why does it matter if, if I'm just, uh, uh, if I have a Hindu identity or I don't have a Hindu identity. All kinds of confusions like that. So as part of this journey, I've been writing 100, 150 articles online, various publish, publications, books and in a typical year, this year I've given maybe 20 talks, 20, 25 talks this year so far. And I've been doing this since mid-90s, going around talking. Because I learn a lot from the questions, I learn a lot from the emails that come. So I'm not sitting in an isolated ivory tower dreaming up things, it's always interactive. And since I'm extremely open and critical of a whole lot of things that are going on, I expect to be attacked. I, I expect people to take me on. And that is a learning experience also because people who are opposed to you also educate you and teach you by opposing you and then your arguments and your research have to become better and better. We had a tradition called Purva Paksha, which we forgot. 
the Purva Paksh tradition meant that you must study the other school which is opposing you. And you must understand their arguments why they are opposing you. You must learn all their arguments just as good as they learn, they know them. And you must know how to argue from their point of view. And then you must standing on your own position, your own siddhanta, your own foundations, your own framework and world view. You then have to give a response after really understanding what they are saying. That is the Purva Paksh system. So, it used to be very active because the way Vedantins uh, debated Buddhists and Jains and Mimamsika and one school of Vedanta versus another school, it is normal part of training. But the tradition of Purva Paksha today needs to be applied not to Buddhists and to Mimamsa, these are not the threats. They need to be applied to the dominant civilizations which are competing against us, which is not only the Judeo-Christian tradition, but also the Western Enlightenment from which comes the notion of secularism. And secularism has got a lot of confusion. My next book, which is out in October, gives you a whole dharmic critique about secularism and many other uh, modern fashionable ideas. But we have to understand the point of view of Judeo Christianity, of the Enlightenment secular movement, and the postmodernism, the very fashionable postmodernism, which is taken on a lot of Indian uh, intellectuals in a, in a very fashionable way. This Purva Paksha has not been done. Our very few people in India are really able to stand on a dharmic foundation and look at the West very courageously. Either if they are standing on a dharmic foundation, they are looking internally. They are saying, we don't need to see others, why should we worry about others, we only need to know our own truth, things like that. That is not what the Purva Paksha tradition called for. It called for studying others and being able to take a courageous stand and argue back. That is how our tradition is. Or you will find people who are critiquing other cultures. There is a lot of post-colonial scholars, they critique the West, but they do it using a secular framework. They, 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 in other words, they are critiquing the West using West's own theories and critiques. So in a, in a sense, they are just mimicking the West's own self-critique. They are not really doing it from a dharmic point of view. So I have tried to do that, and this is part of my own journey for myself, learning as I, as I go. Now, the book that I want to talk about is one of several books that I'm writing. I, I intend to, there is another one coming out in October, as I said, and then two more for next year, and so on. But this book, which uh, just came out uh, a few months ago, has, is now in its third reprint already, and uh, it's called Breaking India. And this book uh, is the result of a very systematic study as to who are the forces, Indian and non-Indian, whose work is to break up the sense of unity in India, the sense of a common history, the sense of a common itihas, and the sense of a common dharma, break up the, breaking up the sampradayas, breaking up the paramparas, breaking up the family system, breaking up the, the the rituals and the holidays, now they are being downsized, new foreign rituals and holidays are coming in, new fashions are coming in, and changing, re reinterpreting and distorting the symbols in, in many ways. So this is, this is a, the intellectual breakup, the emotional, psychological and intellectual breakup of India, uh, which can then lead to a physical breakup also. So this breaking up, break, breaking India project uh, suddenly galvanized uh, in my working, uh, in my life, about a decade ago, I was at uh, Princeton, I live, in, I live there, and I was having lunch with a few scholars, and then another scholar dropped, John in, and I was introduced to him, and this gentleman said that he's just come back from India, so he's happy to see me and had a good time there. So we started talking about, you know, what he was doing in India, I asked him what he was doing in India, and he said I was there for the Afro Dalit project. So I never heard of such a thing, Afro Dalit project. And I asked him, what is this Afro Dalit project? So he said, well, don't you know, this Afro Dalit project, we are running this project in India to try and teach the Dalits that they are actually of African origin and they are the blacks of India. And the non Dalits are the whites of India. So the American experience of white, black, you know, slavery experience is the is what is 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 the experience going on in India. And we want to teach them their true history as a history of slavery by non dalits of India. So I thought this is weird, and crazy, and extreme, and and 
I mean, I, I, I have a lot of sympathy for anybody who's oppressed and want to do a lot, and my foundation has done a lot to help such people. But I don't think that distorting history and manipulating them and making them fight each other is a, is a good way to do it. So I was quite concerned, and I got to know this person, and I got to visit his office, and I wanted to find out who all are running this project, because one of my styles has been, besides a lot of reading and studying and engaging people electronically, I actually like to go and engage them physically. I go to their events, I go to their seminars, I sit in their classrooms, I go to their conferences, and I actually interact in the face to get some response because that way I learn. So I went to this person and I wanted to understand who was funding all this afro Dalit project in India. And he was very open. We didn't think there was anything wrong. We were very relaxed about it. In his office is a map of a balkanized India. And if you take the book outside, Breaking India, it's on the cover of the book. Breaking India book has a map of India, balkanized. The northern part from Afghanistan, Pakistan, all of North India, Bangladesh, you know, is called Mughalstan. It's sort of one this idea. And south they have broken it to Dravidstan, Dalitstan, and so forth. So, this is very disturbing. I said, what, what is this? He said, well, this is a map of uh, India in terms of the real nations and real identities and real histories. Uh, to the country, India is an artificial country. This is the real, uh, you know, if you really look at the, the traditional identities of people and the real history, who they are, this is more natural. He was trying to tell me that. So I started uh, this journey. And by the way, to put this map on the cover of the book was not an easy thing to do. Because at the, uh, I wanted, I, I got this map, uh, it, you go to dalitstan.org. There's a website called dalitstan.org and you can download it from there. Uh, so there's an organization that actually propagates all this. And they'll tell you all kind of things that Dalit, they're trying to do to create a Dalitstan, you know, separate thing in India. So I got to know this gentleman, this scholar, and uh, I, uh, when I got the copy of this map, Ten years ago, then I've been following, doing my research based on it. I wanted the publisher to put it on the cover of the book. And there was a huge legal argument. Uh, publisher sending it to the lawyer, lawyer sending it to another expert. Can you do it? Will you get sued? What will happen? You know, you got this very dangerous map and all that. <laughs> so original uh, cover, which had a huge map as the entire cover, is on my website because they sent me a PDF even though later they wanted to shrink it and make it smaller so it's not too dangerous. You know, make it smaller than dangerous for them. Yeah. So I felt that the, but for my website, I've got the whole one, the big one which they've done earlier. So uh, there at the bottom they put a very strange thing I've never seen on the cover of a book before. A disclaimer saying that we don't believe in the real map, that kind of stuff, just to cover themselves so because they felt that the Censor people are so tough in India, they're going to ban the book or whatever. They were worried about it, but luckily nothing like that happened. Uh, this uh, map is not something our artists uh, have imagined or we've imagined, but it's a real map that an organization has that they want to promote. So I wanted to find out who these people are. And, and so the scholar led me to some names, and then I started searching these people, visiting them, sending people to visit them, making inquiries, very innocently trying to find out who they are, what they do. Often, often I contact groups and tell them, you know, I heard you're doing great things in India, can you tell me more? And they are happy to send me a whole package of things. They are happy to send me back. Uh, or send a $50 donation, join something, they give you access, you know, then you meet, go to their event and find out what they're up to. So I've done a lot of this for 10 years. I found out that there is a uh, Dalit Freedom Network based in Delhi, which is quoted in a lot of media, Dalit Freedom Network. You would think that they are the voice of lives. But I found out that the, all the people who started it and the trustees are white Christians in Denver. They started the Dalit Freedom Network. So, uh, but they have three or four uh, Indian Dalits uh, who are the poster boys, you know, Kanchan Laya and uh, the people, they are the poster boys who go and do all the talking that we the Dalits are being oppressed and blah 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 and the Christianity has saved us. So, but behind the scenes the people who really in power are not Dalits, they are, they are white Christians. So then I wanted to know who are these people and in this book Breaking India we have a whole lot of on the who are the people behind the Freedom Network. 
Some of them are people affiliated with senators, congressmen. Some of them are very right wing type Christian people affiliated with the church. So this kind of group has organized the Dalit Freedom Network. And their affiliate in UK, their affiliate in Europe are doing a lot of uh, championing to get uh, the, the idea of uh, caste as a con condemnation by the United Nations and US and European Union and to consider Hinduism as a racist, uh, a racist ideology uh, and have sanctions and bans against it and downgrading India because of uh, uh, this, type, this type of uh, racism as they call it. So there is a political dimension to this. It is not, if you ask an average Dalit in India, he never heard of Dalit Freedom Network, except what he written in the newspapers, but he never met those guys. So there is, it's a self-appointed group uh, to, which has assumed a huge international power structure. So next time you see something quoted or citing Dalit Freedom Network, you should know that this is not some kind of a real egalitarian voice of Dalit people. And some of those guys who are in charge are doing quite well personally. They're not, they're living a good life. They've been living the international depths of life. A lot of limelight for them, a lot of recognition for them. They're hardly suffering kind of people. So this uh, uh, opened the doors to further in, uh, links. I found out that there is a Joshua project, which some of you know, also in Denver. And they have a 1040 window. This Joshua project is funded by the World Council of Churches and a lot of different denominations to go to third world countries and down to the village level, district level, do a census, keep track of what the demographics are, who's friend, who's foe, who can be bought, you know, all the local level politics, all the local anthropology, all these kind of details they have mapped out. Uh, in fact, uh, some years ago, Sunek, uh, this uh, Tehilka did a major article. Uh, two of their journalists went undercover and for six months into these uh, rural areas to see how the uh, 1040 Joshua project are operating. And they found that a lot of uh, ideologies being smuggled in and they're training youth in these uh, rural areas to think in a very un-Indian, anti-Indian, un dharmic kind of way. A lot of money pouring in for that. And th so this uh, uh, I was very impressed by this Tehelka article. I tried to contact the journalists. In the following issue, they had a lot of complaints, uh, letters to the editor written by the church complaining that this article was published. And then when I went to meet the two journalists who wrote it, I was told that they no longer work there. So it took me a year to find them. Then I got in touch with them and they told me they have a lot more material for a certain amount of money that they need to share with me. Make a lot more material on the kind of underground activities that are going on in India. So then I found that various churches, uh, Mormon church and many other churches, have a lot of money that goes to buy land. They feel that land is a good investment. So they're buying land in the rural areas and putting up a cross, and even though it may be you know, a huge amount of acreage, they put in the one little building and, and it is considered a church property. Now the strategic use of land when land is scarce, uh, can give you power. So for instance, if they, get, they are the ones who decide who will be given the rent, land on rent to do farming. And they will give it to a certain group that they like and not give it to another group they don't like. They could use land to make a college and uh, keep the admissions to those who are Christians or have a very high tuition, but the tuition is waived if you convert. So they can, ownership of land can give you a uh, lot of uh, discretion in, in the local economy uh, and, and this, this, some churches have uh, a strategy like this. We started visiting those organizations in the US that were claiming to be doing a lot of seva in India, a lot of uh, fundraising for healthy children in India. So one of them is called Gospel for Asia, I believe it's in Dallas, uh, maybe some of you know of it. Uh, so we got to know them, we got to visit their website, we got to interact with them. They have, uh, they brag in, they're sending 30 to 35 million dollars, uh, much of it goes to Tamil Nadu. Uh, and, and if you look at the videos they produce, they're talking about Satan worship, they have an image of Shiva and they say that these Hindus are pagans doing Satan worship and the devil is with them and we have to save them and it's sort of like very hideous, aggressive hate speech that would qualify in that, in that way. 
and yet in India they are honored and considered big shots and uh, you know because they bring money and so we got started looking at that and I found that the most aggressive uh, church in terms of legal case uh, against India on human rights human rights become a very big slogan for them the legal case against India using human rights as the argument uh, and using the Dalit the complaints by Dalits as the main evidence that the top uh, church doing this is the Lutheran Church uh, in Europe, the European Lutheran Church, not the American Lutheran Church. And particularly Germany and Scandinavian countries, uh, they have a, a quite a large, uh, very organized thing for the last 15 years uh, to, to take this systematically and then the end game is to isolate India politically in the world community based on this argument and have more and more governments and international bodies uh, declare this so that the uh, Indians will be begging the church for relief to, to get exempted from this classification. It will be at the discretion of the, of, the, of these authorities that are going to be appointed to police India for its human rights. So, um, this was quite disturbing. I've attended some meetings and analyzed thousands of pages of their proceedings and uh, you know, resolutions and minutes and so on which are available. Um, then I discovered that uh, there is the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom. Now, by the way, all these things that I'm naming to you are in the book named. Name, data, evidence, backup, names of organizations, names of individuals. I'm not shy to name people because I have to make sure I've done my homework and I can, I can uh, uh, back up whatever I'm saying and I am sure. So we name these people. The U.S. Commission on Religious Freedom was set up by Bill Clinton because of a lot of right-wing pressure. Uh, he was weak at the time and he needed some support from the right wing to get his bills through. And what they wanted in exchange was this International Religious Freedom Act, which he signed. And it is a eight, nine hundred thousand page, whatever big autobiography that he has done. Uh, there, there's only two lines, one sentence on this act. I mean, he's not very proud of it, but he had to sign it. Uh, it says, on such and such date, I signed the International Religious Freedom Act, good stuff. And then that doesn't come anywhere before or after, it never talks about it. Now this act has huge consequences. This is a big victory for the Christian right. Uh, this act says that under this act they set up a commission, you, Congress will set up a commission, which is a permanent one, permanent commission, called the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom, to monitor religious freedom all over the world. It's supposed to monitor uh, any problems of religious freedom anywhere in the world except the United States. U.S. is exempt from the scope of the act. It's in the act. It says that everywhere except the United States. Now, the uh, interesting thing is, and then it is, uh, it has the authority to uh, recommend countries that should be put on sanctions for economic, U.S. economic sanctions. And India has been on the, on the uh, warning list. Uh, India is on the watch list. And there's only a country like Saudi Arabia, Cuba, North Korea, Pakistan. India is in that category as far as uh, not having religious freedom is concerned. Now, as an Indian, someone raised in India, I'm quite familiar with all kind of problems that India has. And I'm, you know, I'm, there's not a problem that India has. But I never thought that lacking religious freedom is a problem in India. Because if anything, India has got an overabundance of religious freedom. I don't think Indians have a, Indians are constrained. Uh, in what they have to do from, from a religious point of view, Indians are free to practice whatever religion they want. So I never thought that religious freedom is a country, is an issue that India should be on the scanner, India should be on the hot list, India should be highlighted and become the target of uh, inquiry and investigation. But it is. So year after year, they have these hearings in which they bring in some Christian complaint, some Muslim complaint. It's always Hindus kind of the bad guys who have done something. And the people who are brought uh, up, uh, to make the, give the testimony are not selected by Hindu group. It is not uh, somebody like Sanatana Dharma Foundation or Ramakrishna Mission or Siri Siri Ravi Shankar or is not one of the Hindu organizations that tells, okay, here is the religious freedom problem. It is all church people and pseudo-secular people and people that are part of this Joshua project and the Dalit Freedom Network and Lutheran Church and Mormon Church. It is the people that they have groomed 
they have been teaching them and training them and grooming them and putting them in important positions and important committees. It is these kinds of people that are called to, uh, with all their airfare paid and their nice expenses and all that to Washington to give testimony and the testimony is recorded. And there is no counter opinion. I mean, there is no, alter, there is no uh, person, it is not like, you know, there is an attorney representing the other side, like in a proper hearing. And the attorney can call his witnesses. And he can cross-examine the witnesses that the other side has put up. That process is not there. So if there is this kind of a very unfair methodology and a, a kind of a, the, the, the Jewish students that they're following, I think is not very clear, I'm not very uh, uh, clean, it's one-sided. And uh, I've written many times that I'd like to go and testify and to tell you all kinds of things. I like this book, Breaking India, to be on the record as a testimony of what is going on in India, the other side of the story. And that is something that we have not been able to get in. And one of the action items could be, in fact, to put breaking India on the record, saying this is our point of view. And not only for U.S. Commission, but a lot of congressmen who are in the India caucus, and we are donating money to them, and we are doing fundraisers, and we have some clout in terms of what we want. But one of the things we want is to give them our side of the story, let them read it, let them have seminars, let them have Q&A, let them at least be informed that there is another side of it, which right now they don't know. So this U.S. Commission, I started looking at the background of all the people who are running it. There's 15 commissioners. Right now there's not a single Hindu or Buddhist or Sikh or Jain. Not one. Mainly, mainly Christians, some Jews and uh, uh, Muslims. Uh, but the, Jew, the Christians are, you, you know, the, the former president of World Vision, a very radical evangelical organization, people like that. So the U.S. Commission has been run, dominated from a certain ideological point of view because they are the ones who called for such a commission to be created. They are the ones who nominated and got the people in. And even though Obama is against the right wing, he has not done anything to appoint new commissioners or to replace the old ones. Not one thing has been done. And in this book, this book is the first uh, publication where there's an analysis in print of the U.S. Commission on Religious Freedom in the whole chapter, 30, 40 pages. It just goes into details. The background of every commissioner, his links with Christianity, his links with anti-Hindu statements, and what is each year since 2000, they've been putting out uh, an annual report on religious violations in India. And I've analyzed to, to explain what are the flaws, what are the issues in every single year's report. So I have put something out in the face, let them read it and let them see, let me see if they have a response to it, but so far none. So the book is an attempt to compile a, a, a map, a very detailed map, 600 page book, detailed map of who's who in this Breaking India, what I call the Breaking India project, which has been going on for a very long time. The book starts with uh, looking at how the aryan Dravidian divide was also a construction in the early 1800s. It was not, uh, until the early 1800s, uh, people in the South did not say we are Dravidians and you are not, uh, we are different from you. There was no sense of identity of deep difference in the Tamil classics. But th this creation was brought about by people like Robert Caldwell, who was a missionary from the UK uh, and, and many a successes of his. So the, the, the sense of uh, Dravidians being different was started that way. At first it was a, a, a secular identity, a, not a religious issue, but just that they are different ethnically. Then they were classified as a different race. Then there was a, a distorted interpretation of, their, of the Tamil classics, the Siddhanta, the Shiva Siddhanta and the Turu Kural, uh, to show, to try and claim that these are really inspired by St. Thomas that these, St. Thomas came and uh, it is his influence which led to the Tamil classics. Yeah? So this uh, Christianization of uh, uh, Tamil culture started. And then this, uh, this business that whatever resembles Hinduism is a Brahmin pollution, a Brahmin distortion that was added later, but originally it was a very clean thing. And if you convert Christianity, actually you are going back to your original original tradition, because your original tradition was already like that. We are just giving you back like you were. So this kind of a distortion is going on, and there are big movies being uh, made on St. Thomas, how he came and he started the, 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 the whole Tamil civilization and stuff like that, and then Hindus came and invaded, and Aryans invaded and whatnot. 
So there is a division, uh, a fault line uh, in the breakup India, breaking India project, a division of Aryan Dravidian, uh, which concerns me. So my foundation started uh, four lot of projects with archaeologists and hist historians to come up with what is the true scientific evidence say. And in this book, we summarize that. But I also have books, uh, separate books, which are being done by archaeologists on, you know, the Harappan civilization, the Vedic links, so that we understand our own history from our own sources. This uh, this Aryan Dravidian divide is now dominating Tamil Nadu politics and South India politics in a very serious way. And then the other divide I already talked about is the Dalit non Dalit divide. And now they are trying to bring Dravidian and Dalit together and claim that Dravidian and Dalit are common in the sense that the other side is the Aryan Hindu upper caste type of person. So trying to create a, a Dravidianism and Dalitism as anti-Hinduism, as a common united front for anti-Hinduism, is a very serious and major project in a, in a, uh, under the umbrella of Christianity and the Church. Uh, and then, of course, the third divide, the third kind of divide is minorities. The minorities being asked that you are different, your identity is different. So one of the, uh, as a result of this, I wanted to find out why is, why is such a propaganda point of view, which is not substantiated by facts, why is it so popular? You see it in American school textbooks. I mean, I was just having an argument with somebody on uh, model of mind, psychology, nothing to do with all these things. Uh, with a Westerner, he was arguing from the point of view of Ken Wilber, I was arguing from the point of view of Sri Arvindo, and when he got cornered, he suddenly started telling me about, you know, but you have the caste system, the problem is you are, and he started rattling out things which are totally incorrect, totally out of such sources that he must have got. So this kind of propaganda has spread widely. You don't see it if you don't go looking for it. Unless you go asking people and debating and arguing with them, they are very polite, it's a very diplomatic culture, very courteous culture, everybody is very nice to you on the face. So you think that probably everything is okay. But you need to scratch beneath the surface by checking things out, by going and pushing things a little bit, by you know putting a little bit of stress, then you'll understand a whole new dimension of what the what the situation is. So this, uh, this, this kind of... Uh, Influence on education, influence on media is very, very pervasive. And uh, to, uh, to, uh, to, my, uh, to, to solve the mystery of why is it happening, who's in charge, I found there is a systematic media management, systematic. It is not randomly that some media guy picks up a story and puts it out. There is a Christian media network. I, I, it, it was a major breakthrough for me in a bookshop in... Uh, Chennai, I was looking, and there's a book on Christian media in India by, uh, by a guy called Pradeep Ninian, Thomas, uh, a Christian guy. He's written a book published by a very reputable publisher, uh, giving an analysis of how uh, the money for, from Christianity overseas is coming and being organized to, uh, being utilized to uh, control the media and how uh, this, uh, these stories are to be, how there are news agencies whose job is to uh, plant, uh, you know, Christianized versions of a story, Christ a, a story with a Christian twist is to be planted, and how there are training centers where they're producing very good journalists, very nice in English, very polished, and planting them in NDTV, in Times of India, and in Hindu, they're planting them all over the place, and all over the rural areas, and their job is to produce a certain kind of Christianized view through a Christian lens, uh, various media reports. And then there is a network overseas which picks up this and spreads it out. And, and this becomes truth. So the story gets picked up and then it is circulated through various uh, news releases, news wires, and then Christian Science Monitor quotes it, and soon Washington Post is quoting, and New York Times is quoting, and soon, you know, somebody writing the textbooks in a certain state is also quoting it. It becomes authoritative. But our book goes back and sees, okay, where is it from, and then where is that from, and where is that from, and finds out that in, most, in so many of these important cases, it is entirely fabricated. There is no uh, independent verification of a claim being made, there is no court ruling or judgment on which, on the basis of which they are making such a statement. So a whole lot of rubbish uh, is being spread out and considered to be valid by people in this country. 
because there is no one who has exposed them till now. Nobody has done a counter uh, argument to take them on. So these are some of the some of the things that uh, concern me that are in this book. The book is showing the axis of the leftist and the rightist working together. This is very interesting. Uh, the, you would think that uh, an assault on Hinduism from the Christian right is expected, but you would think that uh, the leftists in this country, the leftists in this country are fighting the right wing in this country. The, always the, uh, the, the, the democratic left and the republican right, they are always fighting. So the ideological, there are two camps in this country. So you would wonder why would leftists also join them or join the rightists in this condemnation of Hinduism. And that is in fact the case. Uh, a whole lot of Indian professors in South Asian studies in this country who are exceedingly leftist uh, are mixed up in the sense that it is a contradiction. On the one hand, they are attacking the Christian right to prove that they are right, that they are left wing. They are always attacking the Christian right. On the other hand, when it comes to India, they are working with the Christian right to condemn Indian civilization and Hinduism uh, on the grounds of human rights. So, domestically in the US, left versus right are two poles with tension. But when it comes to the working for, on India, they are working together. Uh, Ford Foundation is a left of center, left wing uh, funding agency. And uh, various, uh, you know, Rockefeller, various other groups are a little bit right of center. A lot of churches are right of center. But in India, they're working together. In India, if they, even if they're not officially joined up, they are funding the same kind of project, they're going to the same kind of events, they are funding the same scholars, the same ideologies. So there is also, uh, what one of the things we're exposing in the book is the left-right unity in terms of taking on India. The right taking it on on the behalf of Christianity, and the left taking on on the behalf of what they think is human rights and secularism and progress and things of that kind. So this is an interesting, one of the things I do is to show how some of these well-known Indian leftists are actually in bed with the Christian right. And this is very embarrassing to them. Because to be told, to be told that, uh, to be exposed that they're actually working in cahoots with the Christian right is a very big problem for many of them. I had a debate with one very important person of that kind. Uh, who heads up a huge uh, leftist organization in, in which I was able to show that on the one hand he's claiming to be a champion of liberation and blah 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 on the other hand he's, in, he's collaborating with the Elite Freedom Network and places of that, people of that kind who are on the Christian right and he was quite, uh, quite embarrassed. So this book is looking at the global nexus for, with uh, uh, people in the West, various kinds of institutions and people in India who are serving this, who are funded uh, the, the total effect of this, the net effect of which is a, a, an assault on Indian civilization, uh, an assault on its unified history, its culture, its, event, its uh, Sanskrit, there's an assault on Sanskrit, there's a desanskritization going on as part of this, and certainly an assault on gurus and, and anything which is Hindu is sort of up for grabs as far as the topic of assault is concerned. So, what am I trying to uh, get out of this exercise, this book, but this particular book. Well, one of the debates I want to start, and I think I've already started it successfully in certain circles in India, but I want to tell you about it, is I want to challenge the notion of minority. Right? Because right now, minority is defined incorrectly according to me. The criteria for minority is incorrect. Uh, I ask the following question. If you were to go to India, and see a McDonald's restaurant and just because the McDonald's restaurant has 20 employees and there are, you know, it's just a small restaurant, 20 employees, you would not say there's a minority restaurant because if, if what matters is not that one, one at McDonald's in isolation. What matters is that this is one branch out of 50,000 branches in the world. The whole thing is one global enterprise. So as a global enterprise, McDonald's is not a minority. It is not. It is only one in a restaurant. You don't take it in isolation. The same way, a church, one little church may be, okay, there's a minority group, but the church is part of a huge Vatican empire, a global empire. The head of the church is appointed by the Vatican. Every bishop is appointed by the Vatican. And the property is owned by a local trust, but that local, all the trustees are appointed by the Vatican. 
And so therefore, indirectly, it is a multinational. And this is a branch office of a multinational. Similarly, if you go to Nagaland, the Baptist Church owns a lot of the, uh, the U.S. Baptist Church owns a lot of the churches there. So they are part of a global multinational called the Baptist Church. Similarly, the Mormons, they are part of the global Mormon Church. So uh, the Lutherans in India are part of the global Lutheran Church. So these are multinationals. And just like you don't consider an individual restaurant or McDonald's in India to be a minority restaurant and give them minority privileges, in the same way, if you have a church which is part of it's a branch office of a global multinational, it cannot be considered a minority. So therefore, any uh, any church, same would be applying to Musk in my in my uh, uh, challenge as a, as a discussion topic. Uh, if it is independent, it's fine. If it's truly independent, in other words, some group of Indians organized themselves, created a church, and they worship Jesus, that is okay. It is, it is a minority religion because there's only a few of them. But if it is set up as a branch office of a multinational under their rules of governance, under their ideology, they select the management, they evaluate the management, they hire and fire, they give the funding. It is no different than any other multinational setting up a shop. So I am challenging, I would like people to debate this. I am not wanting any radical position up front, any extreme position. I just want this to become a topic of conversation. So at least people can open the question, who is a minority? And what is the criteria for being a minority? And I would submit that a group should be evaluated not only on their numerical strength locally in India, but on their global strength. If their global strength is they're part of a billion people all over the world, they're just one group, one little branch office of a group, then you have to you have to evaluate their power as the global enterprise, their global power, their global legal power, their global advertising power, political lobbying power, funding power. You have to look at that to decide whether they are really a handicapped minority group or whether they are really very powerful. And this is if this were done, uh, then the standard and the criteria for who gets to be a minority would change, and it would have to require loyalty. If the loyalty is first to the Indian nation, and the it is bottom-up democratic election of who gets to be in charge of the church, uh, then it's different. But if it is top-down appointment, and top-down from the headquarters which is a foreign country, then the, the, I do not believe that such people should be called minorities. So, the, uh, the, the fear of uh, the danda of human rights uh, from the West, human rights, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, or the human rights admonishments and, uh, and so on that uh, India keeps getting, human rights condemnation, I should say, that is uh, so deeply uh, terrifying Indian leaders, they are willing to do this and say, Are Baba, please save us, don't condemn us and whatnot, because they don't have a spine to stand up and talk back. The China situation is very different. The U.S. every year has also a human rights report condemning China, human rights. But within two weeks, China has its own human rights report condemning the United States. Every time. Every time. So, you know, if you want to be considered, okay, we are one of the great nations in the world, if you want to be considered one of the great civilizations in the world, you must also have a center which studies other civilizations. China studies the West very systematically. And in India, I am running around trying to find such people. I don't find such people. I don't find them among the gurus. I don't find them among the politicians. I certainly don't find them in the Indian Academy. I, just, I don't find them in think tanks who are from the Indian civilization point of view studying other civilizations. It is a very rare, rare, rare random person who is doing it in a very minimum way. China has a whole cell uh, that is studying human rights violations of the West. That is part of their study of the West. The studying what is, where is the Western economy weak, uh, you know, dollar, how to bring it down. Uh, is, I mean, they got plans. They are really studying it out very carefully to take over. And they will, at this rate, take over. And the U.S. is kind of almost feeding that by begging them and so on. But as far as human rights are concerned, China has uh, said, hell no, who the heck are you to tell us about our human rights problem? We're not going to apologize to you. We just totally reject. We throw your, uh, uh, your report in the trash. For the last 15 years, China does not apologize for human rights when the U.S. 
uh, condemnation report comes out. Instead, it gives the U.S. a report saying, shame on you, you got very bad human rights. This is what it is. So this, is, this takes a certain audacity. And to claim this audacity, you must know who you are. Before you can take on an opponent on your own terms, you must know what is the ground I'm standing on. And that is where we are weak because our leaders are not weak. You see, just last week, I was addressing, and I don't want to name you know, Hindu groups, I name non-Hindu groups all the time, because there's enough infighting in the Hindu groups. But I was addressing uh, one of the large Hindu, you know, sampradayas and lineages and organizations that, that historically for, for 100, 200 years. I was, organized, I was addressing their North America gathering, which was happening. Uh, and uh, they were not interested in this pan-Hindu view. In fact, some of their senior people stood up and said, we are of this particular group, and for, from our point of view, all the other Hindus are not legitimate. You must know who is the right Hindu and valid Hindu, who is not. This infighting is so difficult to deal with. This infighting is sort of impossible. They're going back to our group, our founders, interpretation of Veda says those guys are no good, those are no good. All the others that are no good are Hindus only. This is a very serious problem I have. I have this problem with some of these uh, uh, neo-Vedantins, these the modern Vedantin gurus who got big organizations who tell me if you're doing an organization and if you're going to have ISKCON there, I will not come because they're not good, they're not valid Hindus. Or if you have so and so, I don't want to be part of it. It's a very common thing. Yet, with Christianity, they say we are all the same. This is very interesting. With Christianity, the same guys will say we are all the same. They have no problem that Sufi music is also the same as Hindu music. And the Sufiization of Delhi and North India is a very big thing going on. It's the latest fashion is that we are all going to become Sufis yeah, in, in Delhi. My relatives, friends, people from my school and college, very upper strata. Hinduism is sort of like what servants do, lower strata, what my grandparents were like, it's sort of, we've got a lot of baggage and problems, but Sufism is cool, it's in, and this whole Sufi music kind of stuff is taking over. So this business of mimicking what you consider to be superior, and having an inferiority complex about your own self, and this inferiority complex turns into dislike and tension with other Hindu groups, and quibbling over little philosophical details, this is a very dangerous problem. And I do not, be, in my lifetime, I'll be able to directly address this in any constructive way. But I have an indirect strategy, which I'll share with you. My indirect strategy is that if, as a Hindu, my concern is not to argue with another Hindu, if that Purva Paksha within Hinduism is not what I'm looking for. But if, as a Hindu, I'm looking at how we are different from outsiders, the Abrahamic religions, then the differences become so sharp that my fellow Hindu will share those differences. My fellow Hindu will, from another uh, another Hindu group will agree that uh, karma is non-negotiable, reincarnation is non-negotiable, the unity of the cosmos is non-negotiable, the many paths to the truth are non no one history is supreme and, 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 and absolute, this principle is non-negotiable. So once I've defined what differentiates us from the non-Hindu, non the Abrahamic world, that set of commonalities in how we are different, that set of commonalities can also be used to unite us internally. So this is the strategy I'm forming, is not working on internal unity, but external difference. So my next book is called Being Different. That's the title of the book, Being Different. It's coming out by HarperCollins, which is a very major publisher. And the byline is, An Indian Challenge to Western Universalism. And this whole book is on that. It is to explain how the Indian way of thought, the Indian civilization, differs on very, many, many items. Each chapter is a different kind of uh, point I'm taking and showing how we are different. Because by showing our difference from others becomes a reason for our unity. This is a very interesting approach to unity. This is how the West was unified by Hegel. Hegel was the great German thinker of the late 1700s, early 1800s. 
credited to being the founder of modern Western philosophy, modern Western history, modern Western sense of identity. And his strategy was that, you know, Europeans had gone and colonized Americas and Africa and Asia, wherever they colonized different things. And they were bringing back reports of how different people are. There were scholars who were missionaries who were bringing reports on various cultures and civilizations around the world. So he was basically creating the notion of how we, the Europeans, are different and in his very strong opinion, superior to all these other people. What is unique about us that nobody else has? And this distinctiveness com contrasted with others became the melting pot for the origination of what he started calling the West. Until then, the French were French, Germans were Germans, they had a history, the British had a history, and you know, Italians had a history. There was no sense of the West as exists as an entity, and he's the one who kind of really created this notion of the West in a very powerful way. So I'm trying to create the idea of a Hindu identity, history, philosophy, by starting with contrast with outsiders. That is the methodology I'm using. Thank you very much for your time. Example of an intellectual Kshatriya. You know, really taking on the paradigms and really getting into the different fields. And, uh, you know, the, I mean, we cannot find a more eloquent spokesperson for, him, for Hinduism and Sanatana Dharma today in the West. And uh, Sanatana Dharma Foundation, very, very honored to present these awards. Hindu Dharma Rakshaka Kshatriya Award Sri Rajiv Malhotra. I was advised he doesn't need any money, he is very well off. But uh, <laughs> But, uh, you know, we are still uh, going ahead and making a small contribution of uh, $3,001, which goes with the award. We are very pleased to give this award to Infinity Foundation.